I'm Brent Stafford and this is Aftermath of Murder, Survivor Stories, a multi-part video series featuring exclusive interviews with ordinary people who have experienced an extraordinary event, the devastating loss of a loved one through murder. This series goes behind the headlines as survivors share their stories about the loss, grief, trauma and hope for healing in the aftermath of murder. Joining us today in studio is Marlon and Ian Ferguson, who lost their 27-year-old son Graham to murder in 2005. The murder was extremely high profile and made headlines across Canada and as far away as Scotland. Marlon, Ian, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So why was your son's murder so high profile? When his body was found, he had been trafficking 17 kilos of cocaine. At that time, that was the highest drug bust that they had found in Ottawa. And he was from BC though, right? He was. Thank you. And so how did he end up in Ottawa? Two weeks prior to his death, he had taken a Greyhound bus from Vancouver to Ottawa, trafficking the cocaine. When he arrived in Ottawa, um, he decided he didn't want to do this anymore, and he got off the bus and left the drugs on the bus. Uh, two weeks later, he flew back to Ottawa and we reckon that he was told to go back and collect those bags. The bags were in a lost and found depot in the bus station. I think uh, they were saying it was worth about 3.5 to 4 million dollars. So 3.5 million dollars. Significant amount of money. Yes. So he came back home here to British Columbia and he was here for a couple of weeks, right? Yes. He was here for two weeks. And he went back at one point, once first? He went back uh, on a Monday stayed overnight in Ottawa and flew back to Vancouver the next day, the Tuesday. On the Wednesday, he flew back again to Ottawa and stayed overnight in a hotel. Still didn't collect the bags from the lost and found depot. But on the Thursday, he was picked up at the hotel by three men and he was taken to a warehouse in Montreal and kept there for six days. So he was kidnapped. Uh, held hostage, beaten, uh, threatened, uh, starved, and then brought back to Ottawa six days after that. And because of the beating, he picked up the bags at the bus station and crossed the street and collapsed and died of a blood clot to his lungs because of the beating that he had received. And how did you find out? I was working at Valley View Funeral Home in Surrey. And you were uh, a funeral director? I am a funeral director. I was a funeral director for 30 years. I've since uh, given my career up. There was a police officer came from Delta Police. That's where we live, is Delta, BC. He came and informed me that our son had been found dead. Well, how did you feel? Uh, speechless. Speechless. I, I didn't know what to say to my wife. The shock of that, we started to play detective ourselves, trying to find out details. Uh, found ourselves on the internet at three and four in the morning, Googling all kinds of things about drug trafficking and trying to plug in names that, you know, we didn't even know who these people were or, you know, so we became CSI detectives in a way trying to solve some of the questions that we had and, and couldn't get any answers for. When it first ha happened, the very first morning after we had found out, uh, Marla and I were up at five o'clock in the morning and we went to get a newspaper and you're kind of sneaking around as if you're a criminal and we're not a criminal. That's when you find out who your friends are. We never lost any friends over this. Some people say that people will back away from you. We never lost one friend through it. In fact, we gained friends through it. What has happened actually subsequently in terms of how many people were caught? In, in there were seven people arrested. Sentences ranged anywhere from five months to 15 years, depending whatever part the accused play, played uh, in the role of our son's death. Uh, the two main players, one got 11 years, the other one got 15 years. Do you feel like their justice has been served for Graham? Yeah, I think we, 
we kind of figured out very early on, even before people weren't, uh, hadn't been arrested, that our healing could not be attached to whether people would be caught and tried and sentenced. Um, it, it is difficult to, to do that. A lot of people I hear share that they think that they're going to feel better once justice is served. For us, and I don't know how we figured that out, that we would have to separate that. That healing would have to be separate from whether justice could be served or not. We would never be satisfied with what the court could deliver. Is there such thing as healing? Yes. This little guy here, a number of people gave us these little willow tree ornaments when Graham died. I have about a dozen of them. This is the smallest of them, and he holds a balloon that says hope. And we've always had hope that things would feel better, that we will never forget our son, but the big hole that has been torn into our hearts has started to heal over. Not because people have been arrested and sentenced, but because of the work that we've done to heal that heart. We've acknowledged our son's death. We've honored his memory. And we've tried to help other people who have suffered similar losses. And you've also participated in the restorative justice program too, yes. as well. We had a face-to-face -face in Montreal with one of the, one of the offenders. Uh, I just hugged him as if he was my own son. We asked him a lot of questions. We asked him, we said, tell us about you. Tell us about your parents. Uh, tell us about your family, your girlfriend. We just asked him normal questions that you would ask a, a, a people day to day. And you forgave them? Yes. What was that like? It was like taking an anvil off your back. <laughs> there it was, was a freedom. Somebody. There was a freedom there. I think there's a freedom to be able to have dialogue with the person that, <coughs> the last person that saw our son alive, um, to find out what his family was like. How, how come he ended up in a jail? Um, with a serious crime. Did you ask him anything about Graham? Did he have any th anything to say? He said that Graham was naive. He said Graham didn't know what he was doing. He said they didn't know what he let himself in for. So the naivety of the whole thing, it cost him his life. And that was hard to hear, because you, you wonder how could a, your 27-year-old son be that naive? You know, so for me, that was very hard to hear too. We thought we had raised a man, a young man that was wise enough not to get into drug trafficking, but. Did that make you angry? There, there, I think we've always, or I've always been left with that sense of disappointment in our son, that he couldn't, he couldn't tell us. Um, what he had, what he was doing, or what he was involved in, and how deep he was involved in this. The two week in term between him first delivering, taking the drugs to Montreal, uh, to Ottawa, and, and that in term period, you know, he must have been in a really desperate situation, um, knowing that he didn't want to do this. I mean, to travel back and forward uh, twice, uh, he must have been desperate and been threatened. Tormented. Yes. And he never shared any of that Nothing. with family. He Nothing. Shared. And he had opportunity to, didn't yes. he? Yes. We had had a family wedding just prior to our son dying, and uh, all of our family were there from Scotland and England, and, and he could not share that with any of us. So what's your message to people out there like Graham uh, that may get this opportunity for fast money? Uh, my personal message is, Please don't do it. It will cost you your life. It costs our son his life. Are you going to end up in jail? There's two alternatives. You're dead or you're in jail. 
the seven men that were involved in our son's death all have done jail time. Um, two of them were involved in just guarding Graham for those six days, and they did that for $100. They were paid $100. For five years of your life. That's amazing. So the news media, friends or foes? <laughs> uh, the it, media are, <laughs> we found out how to deal with the media. Uh, the media will print what they want to print. So the way we dealt with the media was, they would contact us, we told them this is the way we're going to do it. You will send us the questions and we will send back the answers. We found out this was the most successful way to deal with the media. But then not all the media really is gung-ho on people driving the bus too much for the story. No, well, they're not. And unfortunately, the newspaper in Scotland uh, got a hold of the story. And the headlines in the front of the paper was, Scott drug mule dies in Canada. Our son was four when he left Scotland. Um, and they've used the word mule too, like the Ottawa Citizen has, and, and other papers too across Canada. Our son was not a mule. That's a really harsh word, and that hurt severely. It must still hurt. It does. It does. You still see it in the newspaper, and every time I see it, I get irate about it, to see that somebody else's son or daughter is being called a mule. We didn't, I didn't give birth to a mule. Well, this is uh, Survivor Stories. Why don't we show this picture of Graham? And one, why don't we take a moment and you tell us what is the story, Graham's story, you want to share? He was a good-looking kid, friendly, knew all, everybody. We live in a small community, Ladner, and uh, he knew everybody, no matter what age group. Um, it was... People found it unbelievable, no matter what age they were, that Graham would have been involved in trafficking drugs and that he would end up dead on a street in Ottawa. We have hundreds and hundreds of cards that people have sent, letters expressing that, stories about his kindness, how he looked after uh, two kids in high school that have developmental disabilities, how he taught them how to deal with bullies and how he looked after them. I have letters like that that are just unbelievable stories about him. He was a typical teenager. He bugged the heck out of us when he would set the alarm and let the s s press the snooze button 20 times before uh, he would finally turn off the alarm. You know, He would come in late and uh, bang the door and waken the whole house up. And, he would phone his sister while she was watching The Amazing Race just to bug her. He knew that that was her favorite program. So, but he, he, he was a good, solid dude. He was. He was a good guy. And, and we miss him dearly. If you or someone you know has experienced a loss through homicide, go to the BC Victims of Homicide website at bcvoh.com to find available resources and information on upcoming support groups. If you're interested in volunteering or to make a donation, visit the BC Bereavement Helpline website. And to reach both by phone, call 604-738-9950 or toll free 1-877-779-2223. This has been Aftermath of Murder, Survivor Stories. <laughs>